Called Belteshazzar was great perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream of Earth's meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your av adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places and its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the skies, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven, time, seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High has issued against my lord the king. You will be driven away from the people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when, the, when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O King, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to oppressed. It may be that then you pro your prosperity will continue. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. May my words be your words and your words be my words. And may this message glorify and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> God is in control. I am not in control. Pastor Brian is not in control. Excuse me, honey, but you're not in control either. I told the first service, I said that, I said, please don't tell her I said that. I thought I had to put that in. President Trump is not in control. Congress is not in control. President Putin is not in control. God is in control. This next one may shock you. Hold on to your hats. You may need to hold the hand of the person sitting next to you, but here it is. You are not in control. The book of Daniel, in my, part, in my opinion, is about four people believing so totally that God is in control and then so living their lives as to reflect that belief. As by way of uh, review... The first chapter of Daniel is about Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah believing in God and then living that belief and demonstrating their integrity. The Babylonian army under King Nebuchadnezzar besieged the capital city of Jerusalem and overtook it. Then they took as captives the upper class of the peoples. They actually conquered Jerusalem three times, but this first time is the one where talking about when they took Daniel and his three friends along with the others captivity when they were these four were only youths 15, 16, 18 we don't know but they were just youths you know from Pastor Brian's message how they didn't want to oppose God by eating food that had been sacrificed to the idols and how they were proven right and were shown to be after questioning by the king to be wiser by ten times than any other in the kingdom. In the second chapter, Daniel illustrates God's sovereignty by interpreting the king's dream after appealing to God to give him the interpretation. Notice King Nebuchadnezzar's responses. In the first chapter, the king is highly impressed with the four and installs him in the court in some unspecified but official capacity. 
In the second chapter, the king, after Daniel revealed the answer that he received from God of the king's dream, the king falls on his face before Daniel gives him gifts and says, Truly, your God is the God of all gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have revealed this mystery. Then he promotes Daniel to rule over the whole province of Babylon, much like Joseph was made ruler over the whole of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh at the time. Daniel, then while the king is still in the giving mood, asks the king, and the king then appoints Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province. So they become administrators, and Daniel is in the king's court. The third chapter, as Pastor told us, demonstrates the devotion of the three despite the terrible threats from the king, who must have a very short memory because he was just promoted them in the last chapter, in chapter 2 that we just talked about. Of course, we don't know specifically the passage of time because after all, it must have taken some time to build that 90 foot by 9 foot statue that the king ordered everyone to bow down and worship. Anyway, after the boys come out of the fire unscathed, thanks be to God, King Nebuchadnezzar falls all over himself again, proclaiming, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trust in him. Then he says, Therefore I make a decree, any nation or people who utters blasphemy against their God will be torn limb from limb. And he promotes them again. Now this brings us to chapter 4. King Neb has another dream. I was living in ease at my home, he says, and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that frightened me. My fantasies in bed and the whole visions of my head terrified me. Here is this man who some scholars say was a most cruel tyrant. Some say that before Daniel got back to him, about the first dream, he had killed some of his counselors simply because they couldn't tell him his dream, let alone the interpretation. Some say 30 years had passed between the two dreams. But this king, who was king over the largest dynasty at the time, the top dog, was afraid because of this dream. He calls all of his wise men and counselors in and this time tells them the dream. Remember the first time he said, you tell me the dream and then tell the interpretation. This time he tells them the dream and they still can't give him an interpretation. Even though there is no threat this time of death if they don't answer his question. <laughs> and then in comes Daniel. Why he's last? Well, you know, the hero has to make a grand entry after the tension is built up high. The king then tells Daniel his dream and says, now you tell me what it means since none of my guys could do it. I know that you can because I know that you are filled with the divine Holy Spirit, which he learned the first time. As Kelsey read for us, when Daniel first heard the telling and the Spirit had revealed it to him instantaneously. Remember the last time he had to go to his friends and they prayed and they spent the night in prayer and fasting. And then God revealed the dream. This time he gives it to him right away. And Daniel is speechless. He's terrified because of the interpretation of the dream and what it means. And he has to go to this king, this tyrant, who killed some of the other guys who wouldn't tell him what it means. Daniel has to then go and tell this guy what the decree from God means. This terrible news to this all-powerful ruler and benefactor of many people symbolized by the tree that Kelsey read. The tree that was to be cut down and then he was to be driven out of his kingdom in madness to live like an animal for seven years. That's the seven times that was read. The king tells him not to be afraid of the interpretation. Tell him what it means. So Daniel says to the king, I wish this was for your enemies, both inside and outside of the kingdom. Daniel then tells of the interpretation that Kelsey read, and 
then pleads with him to turn his life around and beg for his forgiveness of his sins, to stop being evil and to be even more beneficent. Does the king listen? What we read in Daniel in the, chap in the verses just next to it, that 12 months later the king was walking about on the roof of his palace overlooking his kingdom. Do you remember what happened to the last king who was walking on the roof of his palace? And what happened to him? It was David. He was walking on the roof of his palace one night when he was supposed to be out to war and he saw Bathsheba. And we all know what happened after that. King Nebuchadnezzar was looking over his kingdom and saying, what a magnificent palace. And it was. Scholars tell us the ruins of this palace and the surrounding city cover 2,000 acres, forming the largest archaeological site in the Mideast. In enlarging the royal palace, which he inherited from his father when he died, he included a royal museum, possibly the world's first. He repaired and built many temples for the many gods of these pagan peoples. He built a bridge over the Euphrates River, which is about a Mississippi-sized river in that region. And he constructed a grand processional boulevard and gateway decorated lavishly with glazed brick. What a great and magnificent capital I have built and a magnificent palace for me to live by my power to honor my majesty. Do you know that it was promised by God in 2 Kings chapter 21 that he would cause his people to be taken into captivity because of their and their king's wickedness? 2 Kings 21, 10, 16 tells us that God says he has had enough. Enough of their following after pagan gods. Enough of sacrificing their children to pagan gods. Enough of their disobedience. In Jeremiah 25, 9, God tells the people through his prophet Jeremiah that he has sent his servant, his servant, King Nebuchadnezzar, to punish the Israelites. This pagan god, excuse me, this pagan king, God uses for his purposes. God is in control. Approximately 40 years after the warning in 2 Kings 21, we then see it happen in 2 Kings 24, verses 1 to 4. So now, some 30 years later, the king is strutting his stuff on the palace, saying, look what I have done with my hand. No sooner are the words out of his mouth. In fact, the scriptures say the words are still in his mouth when a voice comes from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom has departed from you and you will be driven out. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The message interprets it like this. First pride and then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Timber goes the tree. The Kelsey just read for us. Proverbs 14 verse 3 says, Fools will be punished for their words, but the words of the wise will protect them. Daniel, the wise one, tried to protect the foolish king. But the king obviously didn't listen. And with his words, it all came crashing down. The message states it this way. It happened at once. Nebuchadnezzar was driven out of human company, ate grass like an ox, and was soaked in heaven's dew. His hair grew like the feathers of an eagle, and his nails like the claws of a hawk. Hi, my name is Hank, and I'm a procrastinator. This is, you know, like AA, you're supposed to respond. Hi. Hi. Anyway, I am a terrible procrastinator. I talked to Kelsey. I was looking at uh, research, and I found out some cool pictures. And I, said, I was asking her how he would do that. And she said, well, just 
Well, I never got around to the sermon until this morning, so I didn't have time to do pictures. But when I was looking at it, there was these pictures of this man on hands and knees, and his hair was, and his beard was, and his nails were out like this, and there was grass in his mouth. There were, you know, all different kinds of ways that you could do it. And, and I actually saw, and I actually saw pictures of modern day, must, some pastor must have been preaching on this, and he had his whole congregation go out in the yard, and they were all crawling on hands and feet, and grass was sticking out of their mouth so that they could experience what that happened. Now, they didn't have to do it for seven years, but I thought that was pretty impressive, that guy, I thought that, or lady. I thought that was quite an experience. God said, first to the Israelites, I've had enough of your disobedience. Then he says to Nebuchadnezzar, I am in control, you are not. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't listen. Happens just like it said. And then as foretold in his dream, at the end of seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked into heaven. I was given my right mind and I blessed the high God, thanking and glorifying God who lives forever. This pagan God who'd served, believed in many gods. God of this, God of that, God of that, God of that. All kinds of evil ways that they worshipped these gods. He says, thanking and glorifying God who lives forever. His sovereign rule lasts and lasts. His kingdom never declines and falls. Life on this earth doesn't add up to much, but God's heavenly army keeps everything going. No one can interrupt his work. No one can call his rule into question. This pagan king who before had worshipped many gods, who was cruel to the people he conquered, now sees the one God as God of all. In the earlier chapters, we see the prog progression of his realization of God. Now it is complete. Or almost maybe. Did he confess his sins and become a true believer in God? The only God? At the same time that I was given back my mind, I was also given back my majesty and splendor, making my kingdom shine. All the leaders and important people came looking for me. I was reestablished in my kingdom and became greater than ever. And that is why I am singing. I, Nebuchadnezzar, singing and praising the King of Heaven. Everything he does is right, and he does it the right way. He knows how to turn a proud person into a humble man or woman. Humility. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Maybe you've heard that one before. True humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I'd written that in this message, and then I got this, and it's on the front from C.S. Lewis. Thank you, C.S., I give him credit so I can say it. Thinking of yourself less. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 says in part, All of you must clothe yourself with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 tells us, Now the man Moses was very humble. And we know how he was and is still regarded. In Matthew, we are told of Jesus, for I am gentle and humble of heart. And also he was humble and mounted on a donkey. Where do you rank on the humbleness quotient? Is it true or is it false humility? Is it all of the time or only in certain circumstances. Are you looking not to be served, but to serve? Praise God. <laughs>